Hello, and welcome to today's NITSI webinar on meeting and exceeding mobility user expectations with real-time transit information. My name is Lisa Patterson, and I'll be your moderator for today. I am the Tech Transfer and Workforce Development Program Manager for TREC, the Transportation Research and Education Center at Portland State University. TREC houses NITSI, the National Institute for Transportation and Communities. NITSI is the federally designated National University Transportation Center for livable communities and is a Portland State-led partnership with the University of Oregon, Oregon Institute of Technology, University of Utah, University of Arizona, and University of Texas at Arlington. Our webinars are based on original research conducted by faculty, researchers, and students at NITSI partner universities. The goal of these webinars is to get useful research results into the hands of practitioners, academics, and other stakeholders. All right, our speakers today are Sean Barbeau from the Center for Urban Transportation Research, or CUTTER, at the University of South Florida, and Derek Fredheim from Mobile. Sean is the Principal Mobile Software Architect for R&D in CUTTER at the University of South Florida. He is part of the CUTTER Transportation Demand Management Group and leads a group of software engineers in its Location-Aware Information Systems Lab to create prototype location-based services and intelligent mobile apps as part of government and industry-sponsored research. His research interests include intelligent location-based services for cell phones, lightweight data communication frameworks for mobile devices, and mobile application optimization to conserve battery life. Derek Fretheim, um, as the Director of Business Development at Moveville North America, Derek is responsible for building and strengthening partnerships with third-party service providers, transportation network communities, and various mobile mobility providers. Additionally, Derek is instrumental in Moveville's mobility as a service strategy, smart cities initiatives, and developing strategies to expand reach of Moveville products and services, including Moveville's on-demand microtransit platform. Prior to joining Moveville, Derek maintained a successful consulting practice, working with cities and transit agencies to develop customer technology plans and implementations within the transportation space. A champion of customer-facing solutions, Derek has pioneered mobility hub development strategies for the city of Los Angeles, developed multimodal trip planners and digital wayfinding, managed real-time traffic initiatives, on-demand microtransit services, and more. Derek has likewise launched bike share, EV car share programs, and secured over $250 million in grant funding for a variety of clients. He started his career in transportation at the Orange County Transportation Authority in 1990. All right, before diving into the webinar, I wanted to let you know about a few upcoming events. We have an upcoming webinar on August 30th. Um, we are hosting a partner webinar with Oregon APA on authentic community engagement, and Erin Key from Metro and Wendy Serrano from TriMet will be leading that webinar. And then we also have another up upcoming event um, that we are hosting here in Portland. It's our annual Transportation and Communities Conference. And this year, we're trying something a little different. If you're used to our um, past conferences, instead of brief sessions that introduce you to a topic, we'll be offering 16 half-day workshops that will be hands-on and provide a deep dive training. A couple workshops this audience might be interested in include Robert Hibbard and Chris Nelson from University of Arizona's workshop on calculating economic development outcomes of your transit system, and Ranway from University of California Riverside will be doing a workshop on research she conducted at University of Utah on an integrated framework for public transit services, um, balancing operational efficiency and access to equity. All right, and Last slide before I hand it over to our speakers. Um, just wanted to give you a brief overview of the webinar. Sean and Derek will present for about 40 minutes, and during this time you can submit questions, which will be answered at the end of the webinar. We also are recording today's webinar, and we'll make it available on our website. You will receive the video recording and presentation slides in an email following the webinar in the next day or two. And finally, if you're tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. Instructions on how to redeem the credit will also be included in your post-webinar email. All right, and as I mentioned, during the webinar, you can submit questions using the questions pane on your control panel. We'll keep track of these questions, and Sean and Derek will respond to them at the end of the webinar. If we run out of time, we will send out written responses for any questions left unanswered. And with that, I will hand it over to Sean and Derek. And Derek will be kicking off um, the webinar. Good afternoon, uh, or good morning, or 
good day to, to everyone. Um, this is Derek Carnai. And um, I thank you for that introduction, Lisa. Uh, it's, it's always um, mind boggling to me when I hear <laughs> my depth of experience uh, in these events. So it's, uh, it's been involved, you know, being involved in this space since 1990. Um, I've seen a tremendous amount of change, um, I think, in the, the, specifically in the last five years. So I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, Moveol and what we build uh, for transit agencies and cities. Uh, we develop uh, white label mobile applications uh, specifically to to um, to transit agencies and cities who are um, looking to take maybe some of the pain away from uh, fare collection, cash fare collection, but also as a tool set for helping their communities uh, manage uh, mobility services. Uh, so uh, we started this, uh, our development in 2013 with mobile ticketing solutions with TriMet. And since then we've seen a tremendous amount of, of change in the, in the transit space with the micro mobility services, such as scooters, um, bike share, uh, car share, cars of service, there's a whole host of things happening and we're seeing uh, a great deal of trends happening in, in the space. Um, all of our apps are customer facing. So while they are white labeled for the, the agency, they are customer facing. So we really focus on the, the user experience. So what we're seeing in the marketplace today is, is what I call this mobility convergence where agencies and cities are finding ways to provide mobility within their community. And from the, the user side, um, we really see that there's a need, a need in this instant uh, society that we've developed in terms of getting access to information immediately, that users are really looking for the seamless way to access mobility services. Um, that includes taking this, the friction out of having to download multiple applications to, in essence, conduct one trip plan. Um, so that booking and payment piece within that user experience is, is, is really um, something that's desirable within the, the user side. Um, in addition to that, uh, being able to show real-time information as it relates to a transit trip um, or multi-modality trip, which would include not just transit but other mobility services, um, and having the ability to not only set those preferences for uh, what mobility services they may be um, seeing and, and transit services, uh, a specific route, for example, uh, but also really seeing that real-time availability. We know that um, as as humans, sometimes we grow impatient with, you know, getting information. And so the real-time piece in GTFS RT is very critical with respect to that user in enga engagement. Um, from the city side, we, we see that being able to um, obtain data on how people are utilizing the network of, of the transportation system is very critical for planning purposes. Um, it allows them to manage and operate that urban mobility network in a in a better way. So understanding the, how people are utilizing services is important. Uh, on the agency side, um, providing uh, the GTFS RT information really allows for agencies to improve overall quality of service, uh, focus really on customer experiences, um, allowing for open APIs to um, to ingest on third-party apps, that's something that we rely on heavily here at Moveal. And from uh, mobility service providers that may be engaged with this uh, mobility as a service or this mobility con convergence, um, being able to see um, how they connect within the transit system. Because we do see that transit is the backbone of transportation within a community. So this is what uh, we've developed. This is this uh, mobility app. Uh, introduced in 2015. It's our first white label um, mobility as a service app to power the look book and pay functionality across all modes of transportation with multiple providers. So this is why GTFS RT is, is critical with a user experience and trip planning. So if I book a trip that utilizes a bus and connects to say bike share and I have a reservation at the end of that transit trip to connect with with bike share, and there happens to be a delay for whatever reason, whether it be traffic congestion or what have you, uh, 
ensuring that that bike is available to complete my first mile, last mile, the end journey is absolutely important uh, to to me as an individual. And I would rely as an as a app provider on the GTFRT feed to ensure that I can provide that connectivity when you're talking about multimodal trips and, and journey planning. This is why it's critical to ensure that there is specific pieces of that information of that GTFS feed that we have access to. One of the, the critical pieces that um, kind of aligned with this is an actual implementation uh, that we're doing in, in uh, downtown Los Angeles where there are 24 different transit providers who provide service in the downtown Los Angeles um, area. And we now have to ingest GTFS RT feeds from all of these various uh, transit providers. And some of the things that we're experiencing in this exercise is that while the standard, while the feed is, is, is standardized from a, a Google perspective, they may not be 100% um, aligned with respect to how they identify stop IDs and things of that nature. And so this is a very complicated process to, in, to implement on our end when we're talking about 24 different providers within the journey planning experience and ensuring that there's accuracy within that experience on the end user side. So these are the things that um, we see as far as uh, building a reliable mass solution uh, utilizing GTF, GTFS RT, and that is, you know, we have to combine in the journey planning not just the RT feed, but also real-time traffic data, because that imp impacts how a specific route, route is is, um, is on time, uh, but also that MSP integration. So I mentioned earlier the connectivity piece. Um, if there is a delay in actually booking that right and having assurances of the customer that my end connection, uh, if it's utilizing a mobility service provider, is actually in place. And it works the inverse way too. So if I use a bike share solution, if there's something on the other end and I miss my transit connection, it impacts the, the end user experience. Um, so we really see that trip planning with within a mass environment really requires reliable and accurately managed GTFSRT data sources. Um, on the app development side, um, we really are also looking at you know, the reliability of that data, uh, the stability, and that standard formatting. Uh, when we take the exa example that I previously discussed about the 24 different transit providers, um, it does impact us when, as a developer, there may be formatting differences between the way one agency manages their data feed versus another data feed. We prefer working in a regional type of environment that there's this scrubbing of that data to ensure that we see um, a, consist a consistency with respect to that formatting. So whenever possible, if there is a uh, congestion management agency or a prime that is managing uh, data feeds uh, for for regional trip planning that there's also an element that they're scrubbing that data looking at that data on a regular basis and hopefully providing an api that allows us to ingest that single source where it's already been completely scrubbed and formatted um, and reliable so that we can use it um, and again uh, i mentioned this uh, before that you know, customer customer satisfaction is sticky meaning that people constantly and go back to that app and utilize it as a reliable source when the user preferences how i use the mobility as a services in the transit system are aligned within the real-time data feed so that's um that's how we see it um there's a lot of technical elements that i believe sean uh, will discuss and so i'll turn it over to him Great. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the GTFS real-time uh, format, which is, as Derek mentioned, uh, the way that a lot of different apps uh, consume real-time transit data from transit agencies and then show that to end users. So this is research that we did that was funded by NITSI 
uh, looking at how we could improve this GTFS real-time specification to sell, help address some of the issues that, that apps like Move will see when they're using real-time transit data. Um, so as Derek said, there's a lot of anecdotal information out there, like all the different application developers um, that produce mobile apps, um, Movil being one, there's Google, the Transit app, City Mover, uh, open source projects uh, that we've been involved with, like One Bus Away and Open Trip Planner. Um, that you can just tell when customers have real-time information, it just makes them much happier. Uh, there's also been some research uh, now that has documented that, that, that we and others in the uh, research community have been um, part of. So uh, research has shown that there's a shorter perceived wait time for uh, transit riders that have real-time transit information. So they think they're waiting for a, a less amount of time at a stop, even if the actual wait time isn't different. Um, but there is also evidence that it can lead to shorter uh, actual wait times. This, uh, when you tell the user the bus is going to be 10 minutes late, it allows them to use their time more efficiently to go do something else um, while that bus is, is um, being delayed and then show up at the stop right when the bus arrives. And that way they don't have any wasted time in their journey and they're waiting for the bus a, a less amount of time. Uh, it also learning uh, real-time information also learning lowers the learning curve for new riders so it, it makes it easier for transit riders to discover the the different services the different routes that are available and um, gives them the information they need to make sure they connect to the right one at the right time uh, there's been evidence of increased feelings of safety especially at night uh, most likely uh, linked back to the shorter actual wait time again you're not kind of waiting out there in the middle of the night in the dark wondering when or if your, your bus is going to arrive you have confidence that you know when that that's uh, your bus is going to to get to your stop uh, there's also improved perception of the agency in general we saw this at a, a study here in tampa where uh, just the perception of, of uh, tampa uh, the tampa bay uh, hillsborough county uh, regional transit authority or hart um, perception of the agency's image um, improved even though there wasn't any changes to service during this time uh, I was mainly linked um, just to the real-time information. Uh, and a few studies have also shown increased ridership now. So when riders have real-time information, uh, it leads to an increased number of, of transit trips. Um, so what real-time information can do kind of in summary here is improve the rider experience without increasing vehicle frequency. Uh, and as, as many transit agencies know, increasing vehicle frequency, running more buses uh, can be very expensive. Uh, the, the same real-time information can also be used to, to power uh, emerging analytics tools. Um, Derek mentioned that Movil has, has a few of these types of services and uh, other uh, application um, providers do as well, where the transit agency can better understand how their own uh, network is actually operating. So you have the scheduled data, which is how it's supposed to work, but then you have the real-time data, which shows how it's actually running. And, and to really make improvements, that real-time data can be very insightful. Um, so how do the applications actually get this real-time uh, information uh, and get it into the hands of a mobile app, uh, mobile phone where uh, a user can use an app to see the, the data? Um, so typically you'll have a transit agency ser <coughs> excuse me, server on the right-hand side uh, of this image. It will provide uh, uh, the real-time information in this GTFS real-time format, uh, and that changes very frequently uh, based on uh, updates coming from the bus. Uh, wirelessly sent back to the transit agency, and the transit agency formats pushes that out as a new um, a new file that can be then fetched by the application developer server, uh, and then that ends up showing up uh, and and being retrieved by the mobile app that's in the user's hands, and that's when you see real time information for when the bus is going to arrive and things like vehicle positions on the map. Uh, so GTFS real time is is seen a, um, a fairly rapid adoption. Um, I think this statistic is actually old now from last year. So at the time there were over uh, 50 agencies that ha were known to have GTFS real-time feeds. Uh, and this is from information we were able to scrape together. So I think the, the actual number is, is much higher now. And uh, um, as Derek mentioned, and, and I think every single application developer can, can relate to, uh, the quality of this information is, is very, very important. Uh, and in one research study, 9% of riders said that they took the bus less often due to errors in real-time information. Um, so real-time information is good, riders love it, but if you get it wrong, you'll definitely hear about it. And I know I'm the, the lead software engineer for the One Bus Away Android app uh, that's used in, in Seattle, Tampa, 
uh, San Diego and a few other regions. And I'm also the, the lead customer service representative on, on that. So I see a lot of rider feedback and riders are not happy when, when the, the bus uh, ends up uh, being predicted at arriving er too early or too late or the prediction doesn't show up because of errors and, and mismatching IDs and some other things that I'll talk about here shortly. Um, riders do not like that and they will be quick to tell you that as well. Um, so in short, um, G the second version of the GTFS real-time format or, or version 2.0 uh, will help agencies produce better quality real-time information. And this helps you get the information into writers' hands uh, that they want and to do that in a way that ensures it's going to be high quality. Um, so what we probably want to talk about before we talk about what's new in, in version two is what was wrong with, with version one of GTFS real time. Um, so a really quick summary, I won't go into detail here just because of uh, time limitations, but in general, the GTFS real time format includes uh, three different types of information. Uh, there are trip updates. These are your arrival or departure predictions uh, that tell you when a bus uh, is, is based on the real time location of the vehicle. Uh, when it's expected to arrive at a particular stop. Uh, you have vehicle positions, which are the locations, latitude, longitudes of the individual vehicles that are currently in service. And then you have service alerts. And these are uh, human readable descriptions of different events that might disrupt the transit network. So for example, there's a detour on a route or um, you know, buses in a certain area of the city may be running late due to certain public events. Um, it's a way for the transit agency to communicate um, different pieces of information directly to riders. Um, so when, when you look at the, the format, the specification documents for um, these three different types of information, one of the things that, that jumps out when you start going through it in version one of GTFS real time is that there were a lot of optional fields. And uh, we did a count, and so 56 out of the 63 fields, or 89% of fields in, in version one of the spec were marked as optional. And this just doesn't, this starts not to make sense when you start looking at things and, and wondering, you know, how, how, how can this be, uh, you know, right? How can this actually uh, transfer reliable information when, you know, a lot of these things that seem like they should be there aren't required by the specification? And uh, the reason why this happened um, is really a quirk of how the GTFS real-time feeds are implemented, um, which uses something called protocol buffers. And protocol buffers are just a way to um, uh, compress information and make it tiny, kind of like a zip uh, format that you can think of it like that. So, um, and what happened is because of the way that these particular protocol buffers are implemented, um, some of the internal technical details snuck out and ended up in the public facing specification, uh, which uh, they actually don't have anything to do with public transit, but were more uh, implementation details of the format. Um, so if you want more details on this, uh, there's a link here. I wrote a short article online that you can go and dig in if you really want the technical details. Um, the end result, though, is that when there's just a lot of, there, so with a lot of optional fields means there's not really clear guidance to uh, transit agencies or AVL vendors that are producing these feeds. Um, in a lot of cases, it's not clear whether something should or shouldn't be included, and this really leads to suboptimal feeds, poor data quality, uh, which leads to a bad rider experience. And if an agency is using um, these feeds for analytics, uh, it really just starts uh, falling apart, kind of the garbage in, garbage out, and you don't you don't get everything that you should be getting out of the information. Um, so just to give a concrete example here of, of some of the issues with version one of GTFS real time. So uh, when you look at the spec, all timestamps are optional. Um, so in this uh, one example, when this is problematic, so you can have a, a version of the feed, which looks like the text on the right. Um, it's kind of a plain text version of the feed, the uncompressed format. And uh, you can look at, okay, we have a vehicle position with a latitude and longitude, but we don't actually know when this position was, was calculated. Um, so uh, this is a perfectly valid version one feed. Um, this position could be from one second ago or one minute ago or one month ago. Um, we just really don't know as, as an application when uh, this was uh, calculated. So then the question is, well, should we show this to the user? Is this a relevant position? You know, is this gonna be you know, just way far off of, of what the current state of the system is? Um, and uh, you really just don't know what to do with this. Um, so a, a little more involved example here, just to show kind of how 
Um, different things that, that seem to make sense when you start digging in deeper don't. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have a typical um, trip update prediction. So this is saying that um, for this particular trip, the 27725, um, there's a prediction uh, that a particular uh, bus running this trip is delayed by 900 seconds, which equals 15 minutes. And it's saying this 15 minute delay applies to stop A. Uh, so if you look at the right-hand side of the screen and the way that this particular route is laid out, um, the bus visits stop A, goes on to visit stop B, and then loops back and visits stop A a second time and then proceeds on in, in the trip. Um, so the problem with this particular um, uh, trip update is that the stop sequence field, which would tell you um, which time you're visiting stop A, is it the first time you, you visit the stop or the second time, um, that stop sequence field is optional. So if you don't include that, the writer actually doesn't know, does this 15 minute delay apply to the first time you visit stop A or the second time? And this makes a really big difference to uh, transit riders who are waiting at stop B because there's either a 15 minute delay where they can go do something else or there's not. And the delay is actually ahead of stop B when the transit vehicle is coming around the second time. So um, you're gonna have a very upset rider um, at, at stop B if uh, the app uh, doesn't really know what to do with this, it accidentally shows uh, that the delay is after stop B and then it turns out, whoop, just kidding, it was actually before stop B. Rider arrives 15 minutes later to realize they just missed their bus. Um, so what we ended up doing is, is looking, um, kind of anecdotally, we knew that this was a problem based on things that we had seen with some of the open source projects and, and the feedback from um, uh, applications like Moovil and, and Google and Apple. Um, so we, we looked at uh, just kind of a, a wide uh, spectrum of the different feeds that were out there um, to see how, how widespread this issue actually was. And we used some tools that I'll talk about here shortly. Um, so uh, about uh, we looked at 78 feeds total. Um, about 54 of those feeds came back with significant errors that would alter the way um, that information was, was presented to the user. And um, th these errors that I'm talking about here, and I'll be talking about shortly, these are not arrival time prediction errors. So these aren't saying um, that a particular route arrived in five minutes and it was actually six minutes. Uh, these are more substantial errors like this, the stop update, um, or, sorry, uh, stop sequence field missing that results in just really wrong information. So more what I would call integrity errors in the feed um, that could result in just real-time information not being shown into the writer or just kind of wild, um, wild, unexpected things that really cause the riders to scratch their head and wonder what's going on. Um, so 69%, 54 of these feeds had errors and then 58 had warnings, which we would call doing things that strictly weren't um, prohibitive by the, the format, but just really don't make sense in a lot of different circumstances. Um, so the question is, how do we fix that? And um, we got into uh, the G what be eventually became GTFS real-time version 2.0. Uh, which was this uh, NITSI project that we worked on. So uh, we went through the entire uh, GTFS real-time specification and um, for each field we defined new transit specific requirements. And so in, in this um, setup, every field is labeled as either required, um, optional, or conditionally required. And then there's another description field um, for each of these fields which tell you under which conditions, uh, if it's conditionally required, when it's uh, required and when it's it's optional. Um, so to give another concrete example, going back to the problem that we saw earlier with the loop route and the missing stop sequence field. So in GTFS version 2.0, uh, the stop sequence field is now conditionally required, and the um, the case under which it's required is when you visit the same stop ID more than once in a trip. For example, the loop that we saw earlier. So uh, in version two, that's very clear now that you must provide stop sequence in that loop case, uh, which then makes it very clear to transit apps uh, at which point they should show the delay in the route. Um, so we addressed a number of different um, cases like this in, in the final version of, of the GTFS real-time version two format. Um, there's a more in-depth blog post that I did that's at this URL that you can check out if, if you wanna dive deeper into um, some of the changes there and, and some of the, uh, the problems that we saw as well. So as part of this project, um, we also developed a GTFS real-time validator, an open source project that's able to validate 
GTFS real-time feeds. Um, so prior to, to our work on this project, uh, there was really no way other than working with one specific um, application um, developer to really validate a feed if you're a transit agency. And um, this is problematic because you're really just getting one source of, of information and every different application could be looking for different things or just may not be looking for anything. Uh, and it's really hard to kind of have a common platform to validate um, your feeds, understand what's what's working well and what's not. So um, the open source software that we developed as part of this NITSI project is available on GitHub. Um, the URL is is here and, and the copy of the slides will be distributed. So if you wanna go to this URL or any others, um, it'll be easy to do that after this presentation here. So um, you can test both version one and version two of GTFS real-time feeds using this validator. Uh, we implemented, I think it was upwards of 50 different rules um, looking for different errors and warnings um, in this validation tool. Uh, so kind of the main section here, when you uh, fire this up and run it, you'll see a summary of the different errors and warnings that were found uh, in the particular feed that you're looking at. You basically just provide it uh, a URL to your, for example, this is the MBA, MBTA trip updates feed, and you would also provide it a URL to your GTFS schedule data, and then it just kind of churns through that, and um, we'll, uh, you can set it to update at a set frequency, and it'll just keep fetching data and validate every single one of those messages to see what's um, if there's any problems with it. Uh, so in this particular iteration, we caught two different errors. So one was unsorted stop sequence. Um, when you have a trip update, you're supposed to sort um, all of your predictions in the feed according to the order that the vehicle visits the stop. Um, so this particular uh, E002 is the error that it found, and it says the last iteration, so the last request that was made to the server where this showed up was, was number two in this particular monitoring session. So we're able to dig in then deeper and look at a particular iteration. We can see the entire um, feed that was fetched for that iteration, all the different trip updates here. These are all different arrival predictions for different stops. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you're able to see the different errors that were flagged for this particular um, iteration. So again, we see the, the E002, which is one of the rules looking for that unsorted stop sequence. And uh, it was found actually in a couple different trip IDs, which you can see here on the right-hand side. And uh, the, if you, that'll actually, in this case, for this particular rule, show you the, the sorting of the um, stop sequences. And you can see there's a 25 stuck on the end here, which actually should have appeared way earlier in the, the sequence. So it makes it really easy to, to identify problems and then see where they were in the feed, um, which then allows uh, the trans agency or the uh, AVL provider working on their behalf to, to quickly fix problems. Um, so after we had the main validation tool, we uh, can, created a second tool, which we called the Transit Feed Quality Calculator. And this allows us to do this batch validation that I mentioned earlier. So this is the first time um, after we, we had this implemented, we were able to do this kind of industry-wide survey to see how many feeds um, had issues. And as I mentioned earlier, about 69% of the feeds, 54 feeds had errors. And 74% uh, or 58 feeds had, had warnings. Um, so don't feel bad if you're a trans agency, these systems are complicated. There's probably at least uh, one issue in your feed that you could um, try to hunt down, which will make your transit riders happy uh, if, if that is fixed. Um, just if anyone's curious, as part of this, we also did an analysis. Um, there's, this is a detailed version of, of this is in the NITSI uh, research final report, as well as a TRB paper that we had published on this from uh, this past year in January of 2018. Um, so we looked at the most frequent errors and warnings in GTFS real-time feeds. So uh, number one error that we saw in the most feeds was a little over 15, I think it's 16 feeds had this error of um, the uh, stop IDs and the real-time feed didn't exist in the schedule data. Um, E022 uh, means that there were um, uh, sequ sequential predictions where the times were not increasing. So this means that at one stop, you're predicting that the bus arrives um, out of sequence of time. So you're actually predicting that it arrives uh, in a stop later in the trip before it would visit a stop earlier in the trip. Um, other examples, the, the IDs and the real-time feed, stop sequence and stop ID don't match um, that same combination of GTFS. And there's another uh, 54 or so rules that we had implemented that you can um, you can see if you, you're interested how you compare to some other agencies or, or the total state of the industry here. 
and if uh, the errors you're hitting are, are similar to others. Um, so really, what's the takeaway for, for transit agencies with this particular research? Um, so when you're um, working with AVL vendors, either as part of an RFP, or I should say especially as part of an RFP, um, or if you already have an existing relationship with a, a vendor who's deployed your AVL system and, and implementing a GTFS real-time feed, you want to make sure that they're um, using the GTFS real-time version 2 or v2.0 of the specification to create that feed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in the presentation, version two has a lot more guidance on what fields are required and which aren't, um, which will lead to a much higher quality feed and hopefully much less of a headache and, and less cost for whoever's implementing that GTFS real-time feed. Um, we would also suggest pointing to GitHub, um, which is a, a site that hosts a lot of uh, open source projects. This is where the official version of the GTFS and GTFS real-time uh, formats now lives. Um, so whenever there's a change to the format, there will be a proposal on GitHub at this particular Google slash transit site. And um, if you're, this is always kind of the main source of truth. Google has some other websites uh, that describe GTFS real time. Um, in the past, those have kind of drifted out of sync of the main um, source of truth, which is a GitHub repository. So if you're looking to include something in an RFP, um, we would suggest that you use this URL to the GitHub spec, which will always be the most up-to-date version of it. Um, we also suggest that you run the GTFS real-time validator frequently on your feed. Um, real-time uh, is complicated. Uh, as Derek mentioned earlier, it um, involves when you make schedule changes, those can carry over to, to issues in the real-time feed if you have IDs that change in your schedule but don't change in your real-time. Um, so it, it's, it's very easy. You don't want to just run the validator once and then uh, launch your real-time feed and then never validate it again. Uh, you definitely want to validate it frequently to make sure that uh, the data that continues to come out as you make changes to your schedule and to your AVL system, um, that everything stays in sync and that the, your riders are getting good information. Uh, and then also for the GTFS schedule data, um, there is also there is a best practices document now, which is at the URL below. Um, again, you also want to, to specify that uh, your scheduling system vendor or your agency if you're doing managing your schedule yourself, um, follows these GTFS best practices. Um, because if you have bad schedule data, then your real-time data will also be bad. Um, so you want good schedule data and good real-time data. Um, and what's next for the GTFS real-time community? And, and I should also say that the GTFS real-time community is really anyone who's consuming or producing GTFS real-time. Um, so this includes any application developer that's out there, any transit agency that's out there, uh, any AVL or, or scheduling uh, software vendors that are out there. Uh, we really want everyone's voice in, in this GTFS community. So uh, we, one of the things that we're going to be working on um, shortly is creating a GTFS real-time best practices. So this will be similar to the, the G schedule GTFS that we just saw in the last slide, um, the best practices for, for the schedule, but in this case, we're doing them for the real-time. Um, this will address kind of common cases, which um, maybe 100% uh, of the time they don't apply, but in the, for, as a best practice, you should follow a particular um, practice. Um, some of the targets are this are, uh, for potential best practices or the warnings that we're currently flagging in the open source GTFS real-time validator. Uh, there's been some other proposals that haven't had unanimous agreement, but have had majority agreement indicating that uh, most people think this is uh, the right way to do it. Um, and then just other community input. If you're having issues with GTFS real time, um, definitely reach out to me, reach out to the community. Um, you can open an issue on that uh, GitHub project or just send me an email. And uh, we want to make sure that, that um, the, the uh, GTFS and GTFS real time formats uh, properly reflect all the stakeholders' needs. Um, we're going to be addressing some still uh, remaining GTFS real time gray areas. Uh, which if you want to dive in is at the link there and then also just better documentation in general um, that just discusses particular use cases um, for example the ability to cancel trips is kind of already there but a lot of people don't know that it exists um, we're going to continue to add new rules to the validator um, we're also looking at hosting um, the gtfs real-time validator as a service just to make it easier for agencies you can just go to a website and validate it rather than um, uh, running the software yourself on your own computer if your IT department has restrictions or something like that. Uh, looking at other things, there's emerging GTFS service changes. These are changes to the network that alter the path of, of trips or order of stops. 
um, which DTFS real time just doesn't cover as of today. And we also want to focus on additional open source tooling for prediction generation. So how can we fix those prediction errors when we say the bus is going to arrive in five minutes and it's actually six? Uh, we're in the process of, of uh, archiving a number of different GTFS real-time feeds and then using uh, machine learning to try to uh, better predict when the bus will arrive. And we plan on using the, the transit clock software as part of this pipeline. Uh, this was formerly the Transit Time Project. If you want to find out more about that, the link is below. Uh, so with that, um, I think that uh, finishes our presentation. Um, both Derek and I's contact information is on the slide here. and. Uh, if there's any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Great. Thank you, Sean and Derek. Um, for those of you viewing the webinar, please feel free to continue to submit your questions if you have them. Um, it looks like we do have a couple questions already. Um, so the first question, do multimodal booking apps share users in-app booking and looking behaviors and or mobility service feedback with mobility service providers, for example, transit agencies, scooter sharing companies, to improve data feeds or service? So I, I can briefly touch on that. Um, so I think the feedback process, the loop coming back from you know the, the transit rider back to um, uh, back to the transit agency, as well as um, you know, feedback from and, and maybe data collected from the application developer back to the, to the transit agency are both really valuable things. Um, we did a research project that was focused more on the former of how do you get user feedback uh, back to the transit agency in an effective way. Um, we leveraged the Open 311 specification for that and did a, a pilot in Tampa. Um, and uh, um, if you're interested in more details on that, I can um, certainly share it. I think the sharing of data collected about users uh, definitely uh, varies on, in terms of which applications um, will share uh, that type of data with uh, transit agencies. And I don't know, if Derek, if you want to talk specifically about Moval and, and what you're able to do with that or other industry examples. Yeah, this is Derek. Um, thanks, Sean. Um, I, I think really part of the challenge here uh, is how do you align notifications for a booked trip and the impact in the event there's a delay uh, on a reservation system. And part of the challenge that we're confronted with in order to complete that uh, multimodality journey is if the impact is uh, means that the end mobility service provider uh, loses that booked trip, and what are the consequences associated with that? So, uh, by example, if in journey there's a you know a traffic accident and the bus is late, and the impact to, to actually accessing a scooter or a bike share or even a you know a TNC type ride, how does that you know does that get completed, and are there uh, payment consequences associated with that? And this is this is a big challenge for us as a third party app provider is to balance those um, specific use cases when we're integrating with mobility service providers and what are the business rules associated with that and are, are there any financial consequences on behalf of, of a late um, arrival, um, specifically when you're talking about potential loss of revenue from the MSP side. So these are the things that we have to actually negotiate through um, and balance out at the same time. Okay, great. All right, the next question. Are you aware of GTFS real-time data being used to retroactively correct inaccurate or changed GTFS schedule data? Uh, yes, Sean. So yeah, there, there are a few examples out there, um, including a few open source tools that kind of target that. Um, and it's it's something um, that we're working on. There, there's an open source tool called Retro GTFS, uh, which we've been using recently, which um, we'll take your archive GTFS real-time data and turn it into the GTFS schedule format. And this allows you to then use um, existing tools that can, um, for example, compare two GT GTFS data sets to see um, what the differences are in terms of arrival time. So that allows you to take the transform GTFS real time and when, when did the bus actually arrive and compare it to the schedule time. Um, so that's a, kind of one project that I think is an essential part of that loop. and. Um, if you want to reach out to me, I'd be happy to provide um, links to that and more information. Great. All right. And um, 
just have one other question. So if anybody else has questions, please feel free or uh, Sean or Derek, if you have want to elaborate on anything. Um, one other question though, before that. Um, so is there any before or after data with the going from GTFS real-time version 1.0 to 2.0 um, showing decrease in errors and warnings? That's a really good question. And um, so the, the short answer is GTFS Real-Time 2.0 is still pretty new. It was the the spec was finalized, I think it was September of, of last year. So it's um, under a year old. Um, we One of the reasons we captured the data that we did um, right after we developed the validation tools uh, as we could, so we could do that kind of before and after comparison, at kind of an industry level, and and we do have internally some of like per agency numbers on on errors. So, um, so yeah, so we we haven't done that yet, but it's something we definitely plan to do, and, and we want to try to track over time to see how these some of these improvements in, in the specification yield actual benefits in terms of reduced errors and warnings. Yeah, I just. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, this is Derek. I just I want to mention um, to this point that the data reliability and, and limitation for errors is critical with customer facing uh, apps to um, to I think Sean's points um, and utilizing those validator tools are essential. Um, aligning your feeds with best practices, but one other thing I want to underscore is. <clears throat> is really providing solid documentation uh, that is handed off to third-party integrators like Moogle is, is important as well because we are constantly seeing differences with, with the way feeds are, are managed and constructed and documentation to help us kind of navigate those, those nuances are, are important. So I, I just sort of wanted to echo that one point. Um, that those that are managing these feeds, if, if you're not providing documentation that assists third-party app providers in, in utilizing those data feeds, um, then we're missing a, a, a component as well. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, we had another question come in about AVL providers and whether or not um, you're having any luck getting um, AVL providers to make necessary hardware changes to support the GTFS real-time data. So, Derek, do you want to take a first shot at that based on your experience of working on the integration side? Sure. Um, we um, we don't provide AVL uh, technology, but we do work with third-party providers who are assisting agencies with AVL. And we are seeing um, a greater flexibility with respect to the equipment side. Um, but for the most part, you know, data, data is only as reliable um, or as good as it is um, with respect to that reliability factor. So if there aren't clean APIs to integrate with, with that equipment uh, to provide that data, then you know, we, we lose uh, the ability to, to really provide uh, quality information. The other thing that, that is important as well is how often that feed is updated. In some cases, if it's five minutes in an update situation, um, that's really not considered real time. Um, and we know that there are cost considerations with respect to any sort of data packages that the agencies are required to pay in order to ensure that their data is um, updated on a regular basis. We're seeing, um, we're seeing some agencies get creative with respect to um, use, using Wi-Fi type networks to, to broadcast data on a more frequent basis. But the frequency piece I think needs to be underscored as well, because if it is five minutes um, in arrears, then it's really not as real time as a customer expects um, on the end user side. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll chime in on that too. So, um, so we've had the experience of developing two different GTFS real time feeds ourselves. And um, so two of the, I'm showing here overlapping on the screen, um, so there's a list called Awesome Transit. Um, if you just Google it, most likely you should stumble on it or um, it's under our GitHub um, uh, organization on, on, um, in terms of different open source projects that have been developed to translate 
vendor X into the GTFS real-time format. So um, as you can see, there's a really long list now of different um, uh, us and others that have developed converters to convert from different vendors to GTFS real-time. Using this, um, we've seen, I would say over the last year or two, uh, we've seen an accelerated boost. And in, in, um, I think both as a result of some of these tools being available and uh, as a result of agencies just asking for GTFS real-time feeds. Um, when they do RFPs, um, we've seen a, a, a large number of vendors make the shift and, and provide that, including, I think, at least one that I'm aware of that um, where the AVL vendor gave, even though the uh, GTFS real-time feed wasn't in the initial scope of the contract that was signed with the agency, um, the AVL vendor included it for free as part of their uh, maintenance updates, uh, which I think was a pleasant surprise to everyone involved. Um, so we're definitely seeing an increased um, deployments of feeds. Um, I, I would certainly encourage agencies when you're putting out RFPs um, to ask for GTFS real time and again ask for the, the version two to make sure that uh, you get the, the version that has a little more clarification on which fields are, are optional and which are, are not. Great. All right, and we have a question about uh, cybersecurity and the impacts that, um, that cybersecurity has on real time uh, data feeds. Yeah, so I'll take a shot at that. So we're actually working on another cybersecurity project for the Florida Department of Transportation, looking specifically at transit cybersecurity. And uh, the way that these GTFS and GTFS real-time feeds are shared are basically web servers, web applications. So um, you're, it, when you set up one of these feeds, um, it, it, you know the same caveats come along whenever you would set up another web application used internally by your by your staff or an externally facing website or something like that. So um, it, it doesn't, there's really nothing extraordinarily special about the way that some of these, these feeds are built. Um, they can be built using any different number of, of server side, you know, whether programming languages, Java or .NET or however else you wanna develop this feed. Um, there are some existing um, libraries that can help with that process too, and including some of those that I just showed on the screen. Um, so I, I think you just, you wanna follow the same best practices that you would setting up any web server or web application. Um, but beyond that, um, it, it, there's really nothing technically special about um, setting up one of these feeds. Yeah, I would um, like to add some context as well. Um, one thing that uh, I think agencies should consider is since this, you know, the, the idea of creating GTFS um, and data feeds and providing it to third-party app providers such as Mobile is to enhance the overall customer experience and provide information out to the general public. One thing that an agency can help in terms of ensuring that there's a specific set of reliability um, with maintaining that feed and maintaining uh, the data as, as as it's represented. So if it's, rep the way I look at this is that we are representing the agency with respect to the data feed. So one one element that, that the agencies can consider is a certification process for the use of that feed for third-party app providers. In other words, ensure that that, that third-party app provider, when they are using your feed, is ensuring that it, it's delivered to the customer in a specific way as the agency is looking for, the use of that, how is it being used, you know, those types of things, which, you know, ultimately is a benefit to you as an agency because in the end, that third-party app is representing your service. And if it's not you know, updated frequency frequently on the app uh, provider side, then it's really not helping you from the agency side, um, specifically from a customer service perspective. Great. Sean, did you have something more to add or? Um, I'll, yeah, I'll just say on that point, I think, you know, communication is key. It, it goes both ways. I think, you know, app developers have also been surprised by changes that the agency, you know, were working on that, that, that the, um, the app developer didn't know any of, anything about and vice versa. You know, app developers could do something that transit agencies weren't expecting with the data. So I think developing some type of communication with um, the different application providers that are using your data um, and just, I think, understanding how they're using it. Um, is is really beneficial 
there's ways to do that that doesn't create kind of undue um, burdens on, on the applications that are developing and using your data as well. So like any relationship, you want open communication and, and want to make sure that, you know, if there's any changes coming up or any issues to be addressed, you're able to do that quickly. Okay, great. And um, another question came in about uh, asking your thoughts on current ridership loads and vehicle capacity. Uh, capacities and how they play a role in GTFS real time or in third party app providers ability to provide full information to customers. That's a really good question. So we, um, we our campus shuttle system uh, here at USF actually does provide uh, real time occupancy information. And that was relatively rare, I think a few years ago when we were first working, it was actually when we were developing the GTFS real time feed for our, our campus shuttle system here at USF. Um, so as part of that, we did add a proposal to GTFS real time. And as of today, there is um, a field in, in the GTFS real time spec where you can indicate occupancy at different levels, um, such as like empty, uh, somewhat full, you know, full to capacity and, and that type of thing. So um, personally, I'd be interested in seeing kind of more raw numbers in that as well. And if, if there's other, I think, other application providers or transit agencies that are interested in conveying, you know, a raw percentage full or something like that. Um, that's certainly something that could be added as well. But if you have more more questions, I can um, feel free to shoot me an email and I can point you directly to the occupancy status um, part of the GTFS real time spec. All right, great. And it looks like we are coming up on our end of our webinar and um, currently there aren't any open questions, but feel free. It sounds like Sean and Derek are both open to additional questions after the webinar. Um, I guess I have just one last question to wrap it up and to hear um, about potentially additional resources or communities that agencies or app providers um, can join or find. Uh, you had mentioned some best practices that are starting to come together. Um, do you have any uh, suggestions? Yes, I, I would suggest, um, so the, the gtfs.org is, is a place um, where you can look to see um, about different, um, uh, the different best practices that are available. Um, currently, there's some documentation there for um, the best practices for GTFS and, and GTFS real time mm -hmm. information would be there soon as well. Uh, some other general resources um, in terms of different communities as well. Um, the uh, the uh, Google uh, Transit repository, if you're uh, interested in uh, reaching out and, and have a proposal about the GTFS or GDFS real-time specification, um, this is on GitHub as well. You can just open an issue and you can see there's kind of some out here and, and myself and a lot of others that are monitoring um, and, and developing uh, proposals for the GTFS can then comment on it. Um, there's also the Transit Developers Google Group, which has kind of historically been um, in a forum exchange between a lot of different application developers and, and transit agencies. Um, so if you post a message on this Google Group, you'll typically get uh, a response pretty quickly. Yeah, these are all great resources. I, I would also encourage um, agencies to work um, together collectively and share that information um, and, and understanding how um, the GTFS formats are being utilized and, and where they're seeing you know, successes and sharing that information is also uh, a good way to uh, to help uh, help you out here. All right, great. Well, go ahead and pull up our last screen here. Um, with that, this this does conclude our webinar. Thank you for joining us today. And thanks again to Sean and Derek for sharing their work. You can view our other professional development offerings on our website at nitsi.track.pdx.edu. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.